Welcome to this video on building networks. Hopefully you have realized that I'm not with you today and that you are experiencing a cover lesson. Uh, but during this lesson, do not fear, I have plenty of stuff in store for you to progress your learning, how lucky you are. Um, you are gonna need a few worksheets for this. You're gonna need 4.1, which is um, the worksheet that I've already given you on networking, and then you're going to need uh, a new worksheet 4.2 on network hardware, which you should have been given. If you haven't got it yet, then please ask your cover teacher for it. So, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of to topologies, which um, we started looking at on Thursday, and you should have done um, some prep on with the Google form. Uh, then we're going to talk about network hardware. And finally, for prep today, you're going to be looking into Wi-Fi and how it works, and specifically these things, frequencies, channels, and the use of encryption. So, network topologies. Topology just means how the network is laid out. So what is its physical layout? How, uh, what is like the design on how everything connects together? Um, and there are two that you need to know, star and mesh. And a star topology, this one here, is called a star topology because it uses a central switch, or sometimes a server, um, which sits at the center of the network. And all the devices connect with their own connection into that device. And it creates a sort of a star pattern. That's why it's called the star network. And then the mesh topology has all the devices connected either directly or indirectly to each other using lots of cable um, or wireless connections, which is much easier. And notice there's no central switch or server in the middle. So let's talk a bit more about star topologies. So as I've already said, all of the devices connect directly to a central switch. So here we've got some client computers, like the ones in the classroom. And here maybe we've got a server and another server over here. And they connect to the switch as well. And if this device wants to get a file from this server, it sends a request to the switch, which sends it on to the server. The server then responds. It goes back to the switch, back up to the client. If this client wants to share a file with this client, it sends a message down to the switch, which sends it back up to that client, and so on. We're going to look at switches a bit later, so don't worry if you're not sure what a switch is. Um, we'll be looking at that later in this video. But as you can see, there's an indirect connection between all the devices on the network. They all have to go through that central switch. And this could be a wired connection, or it could be a wireless connection as well. Now, there are several advantages to star topologies, which is why they are by far the most popular network topologies. Um, the most important ones are probably that if there's a broken connection between a client and the switch, it doesn't affect anything else on the network. So if we got rid of this connection here, um, you'd still have a perfectly good connection for all the other devices on the network. And security can be increased because all the devices have to send all their data through this central switch or server. And that server could act then as a, as a checkpoint, checking for viruses and so on and so forth. Um, it, a topology based on the, sorry, a star topology also reduces these things called data collisions. That's where, let's say that we had three devices oops, all trying to send data down the network at the same time. If we didn't have this central switch, if they were sort of all directly connected to each other, then you could end up having uh, data being sent by two devices at the same time. And th at the end of the day, those, those signals are just electrical signals on cables. And they might interfere with each other, and that's what we call a data collision. However, with a switch, everything gets its own unique connection to the switch. It doesn't share that connection with anything else. And the switch can process those incoming signals and make sure that it sends signals to other devices in ways that aren't going to do any collisions, which improves bandwidth and reduces any transmission errors on our network. Finally, it's really easy to add new devices to this network. All you need to do is get a new device, connect a cable to the switch, and it's done. Simple. There are some cons, however. Um, if this central switch or server goes down, then what do you think is going to happen to the whole network? 
That's right, the whole network will be impacted. It will completely go. These devices will no longer be able to communicate with each other if this central switch is in any way compromised. The other thing is that it can be very expensive to wire every single device into the switch because every single um, computer or device is going to need a cable that goes all the way back to that switch. Whereas if you had a, a simpler network, like a ring network, which is one where one device connects to the next device, connects to the next one, connects to the next one, and the next one. You only need short lengths of cable, just enough to go from one computer to the next. But they have loads of other issues, so it's not really worth the advantage. So a start topology has quite a lot of cable involved, which obviously can be a little bit expensive. And also you've got to have these switches, and they cost money too, so there's a bit of cost there. But really the main worry is if the central switch goes down, then the whole network goes down too. So your second topology you need to know about is the mesh topology. And this is what we call a decentralized topology. There is nothing in the middle holding this thing together. There is no central server, no central switch. Instead, all the devices are either connected directly to each other um, with these cables, and all, which are all these wires which signify a direct connection, and that's what we call a full mesh. That's where every device is connected to every other device. Or we might have a partial mesh, which is where some devices are directly connected to others, uh, but some are not. So let's imagine there maybe was no connection between these two. Imagine this line is gone. Um, they could still connect direct, indirectly by going, say, from this one to this one to this one, or from this one to this one to this one, but there was no direct connection. So all the computers are connected to each other, either directly or indirectly with no central device in the middle. That's a mesh topology. Uh, now, there are some pros to this. Um, they're very, very reliable. You've no longer got that single point of failure. Let's say this computer was knocked out. OK, well, we couldn't get any files off it, and we couldn't use any of its resources. But all of the other computers on the network could still talk to each other. So we avoid that problem that the star topology has. They're also very, very efficient, because data can be sent along the fastest route. So if, for example, we wanted to go from this place to uh, this one, we have a few options. We could send directly, um, or we could go via this one, or we could go via this one. And there might be circumstances where it's quicker. Let's imagine we didn't have this central connection. Let's imagine that this computer was busy doing something. So going up to the top and across, let's imagine that was quite a slow connection, because this is busy versus being here and going down to this one, which is idle, it's not doing anything, and back up there. That might be a much quicker route. So the mesh topology gives us several different routes to send data around, which helps increase bandwidth and keeps our network nice and efficient. And this is really, really easy to set up using Wi-Fi, because now imagine that instead of a cable, this is just a wireless connection between all the devices. All of a sudden, you can see that that's actually really easy to set up. You don't need any central hardware, don't need any central special switch, Everything can just connect to each other nice, and you can make these sort of ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer networks really quickly. There are cons, though. If you're going to create a full mesh network using uh, cables, then if you thought it was bad with the star topology, it's even worse with mesh topology because you're going to need so many cables. This is just a small network of five different computers, and yet we've got one, two, three, four, five, six... Uh, seven, eight, nine cables. So imagine if you had 20 computers like we do in the computer room. Imagine doing that where every single computer had 20 cables coming out of it connecting to the other computers around it. It would be so expensive and it would involve so many ports on each of these different computers. In fact, you'd need a switch for each computer in order to connect them all up. So that would be really expensive. Okay, that's star and mesh topologies. I want you now to go and work in, uh, finish off pages 9 to 11 in worksheet 4.1 um, on those topologies. Okay, so we've talked now about the topology, the layout of our network. Um, now we need to think about how we're actually physically going to plug everything in. I mean, what's the hardware involved in making a network? And essentially, there are three different areas of hardware you need to be aware of. There's the transition media, which is kind of like the cables. There's switches and routers, which are 
kind of they're the boxes with the flashing lights that you'll see in the corner of the room. And there are wireless access points, and those are needed to provide Wi-Fi or wireless connections. So transition media, what does that mean? Well, media is just the plural of the word medium, and a medium is a means of doing something or transmitting something. Um, so transition media is just the way that we're going to transmit data. Basically, we're talking about wires, or we could be talking about radio waves as a transition media if we were talking about a wireless network. But in a wired network, this is what type of wires are we going to use to connect our computers together. And there are three different types of wire you should be aware of. The first one is twisted pair. Now, this is your bog standard network cable. If you took a normal network cable and cut it through, you would see that there were eight copper wires inside in these little twisted pairs. That's twisted together, twisted together, twisted together, twisted together. These are by far and away the most popular um, network cables um, that are used in Ethernet networks. And so, as I say, these copper wires twisted together, which reduces internal interference. So by twisting them together, you're kind of making the signal a bit more robust. So what goes down the green wire is less likely to be influenced or interfered with by what goes down the red one, the brown one, the blue one, and so on. Um, these come in different categories. We call them Cat5, Category 5, 5E, and 6. And they define how quickly and reliably they can transmit data. So a lower category might transmit data more slowly. So nowadays, if you were going to put a new building in or a new network, you would want to use Category 6 cables, which can transmit sort of 10 to 100 gigabytes of data in a second. Whereas probably in most of the school will have Category 5 or 5E, which works between 100 and 1,000 megabits. Then we've got coaxial cables. You don't see many coaxial cables anymore. Um, these are used actually for TV aerials a lot, and they're used for uh, sort of old phone connections, and they're used for cable modems a lot. So if you've got a Virgin Media connection, chances are where your Virgin Media box in your house connects via a wire to the box on the wall, chances are it's using one of these coaxial cables. And a coax cable um, has a few things uh, which, again, help sort of reduce interference. So we've got a single copper wire down the middle which actually transmits the signal. All your data is really going down this single wire. And then we've got this plastic layer around here which is to, um, that sort of gives you again more insulation. Uh, and then we've got this metallic shield or mesh around the outside which, which give, protects you from external um, interference. And then we've got a, a plastic coating, just because it's got to have a plastic coating that just protects against the weather and against getting snagged and torn and things like that. So these cables, as I say, are used most often for connecting things like cable modems to the internet. And then the final cable I want you to know about are fibre optic cables. These use beads of glass. So we've got loads of strands or fibres of glass, glass fibres, hence it's called fibre optic, and they transmit data as light. And they are extremely fast. And literally, they can transmit data at the speed of light if the computer can produce it that quickly. And they can send data as light over very long distances with very, very little uh, loss in quality, um, very little interference, um, very little delay or latency. So they are really fast, they're really good at resisting interference, um, and they are brilliant for sending a lot of data over a long sort of range. So if you're going to build a, a WAN you, connecting together several different LANs, you'd probably use a fiber optic cable to connect the LANs together to form the WAN, whereas you'd probably use twisted pair cables inside your LAN for your internal communications. So that's fiber optic cables. They transmit data as light down very fine threads made of glass inside this outer protective layer. OK. I'd like you now to take worksheet 4.2 and complete pages 1 and 2, um, which is just filling in the blanks about twisted pair cables, 
coaxial cables and fibre optic cables. And once you've done that, then I want you to complete the activity on page three, where you just have to name the type of cable that corresponds to the description in the table. So we've looked at the cables. OK, we've got loads of cables. I've got loads of computers. But how do I plug the cables into the computers? We need some physical ports. We need some boxes we can plug things into. We need sockets on the computers. And those things are NICs, or network interface controllers, switches, and routers. And that's what we're going to be looking at for the next section of this video. So a network interface controller, or card, is what gives you the little Ethernet port, as we often call it, the network port on the back of a computer. Um, now this is, is probably from a very old computer where you had to buy these separately and add them onto your computer as an expansion card. Nowadays, this is built onto the motherboard and you'll probably find if you've got a PC laptop, you've got one of these built in, all the like Raspberry Pi computers, all of the computers under the desks in the classroom have these built in on the motherboard so you can plug cables straight in. So, a network interface card or controller is a piece of hardware that connects a device or a computer to the network. As I say, they used to be on separate cards like this, but now they tend to be built onto the motherboard. And you can also get wireless versions of these. So instead of providing a port where you plug a cable, uh, it would have an antenna inside it and a chip, which then allows you to connect via wireless access points onto a wireless network. Now, a network switch is where, let's say we've got 10 different computers, all with one of these, and we've plugged a cable in one end here. The other end of that cable is going to go into one of these ports. And the switch is what allows you to connect, in this case, up to 24 machines all together in a little star network configuration. And you can actually connect switches to switches to switches to switches. So you can have 24 on one, and then another 24 on another, another 24 on another, and so on. And that's how you build the network up. And indeed, that's what we have in school. In each classroom, there might be a switch or two, and then they will group together, and they'll connect to like the main core in the Goodwin or Skipwith buildings. So network switches, they, they connect devices on LANs. Okay, so if you're on a local area network, you're going to be using a switch to connect all the computers together. Switches receive data in units. We call them frames. And they, that comes from each network device. So a network device sends data as a frame. And then the switch will get that frame. It will look inside it to find out who it should be going to. And then it sends them on to the destination device. So we might have a computer connected to port 1, sends a frame of data, and it might have the address of a computer that's connected to, say, port 9. So the switch will route that data over from 1 to 9 and send it off to the recipient computer. Switches are very clever. They can learn what we call the MAC address, and we'll come to that more uh, in the next lesson. But they learn the MAC address of each device on the network, meaning that data can be sent efficiently um, and securely between devices. So. Before we had switches, we had these things called hubs that looked the same. They had loads of ports, loads of things connected. But when you sent data in on a port, it rebroadcasted out to every single computer. But if you were sending a, a secret message between, from this port to that port, you don't want all the other ports being able to read that data. Switches avoid that because they send the data directly to the, to the recipient, whereas hubs used to rebroadcast the data, making them very, very insecure and actually using up a lot of bandwidth as well. Now, routers look almost identical to switches, which is why I haven't put a picture in. And indeed, often they're actually integrated within them. But a router is actually a separate device, and it does a really special thing. Routers form the sort of bridge between a local area network and a wide area network. And they work by... They connect to switches, and when data is sent around the switches, maybe data is sent, uh, let's say this computer wants to talk to a server on the internet. It will use an IP address, and when it sends that data, it will say, I want to send this data to a computer using this IP address. It goes down to the switch. The switch says, mm, that's not one of the devices on my network. I'll send it to the router. And the router says, yeah, that's not on my local network, so I will rebroadcast it onto 
another router somewhere on the internet. And so the router forms this gateway or this bridge between local area networks and wide area networks. So we could say that routers connect computer uh, connect networks together. Okay, we've got a network here in the LAN and we'll have other LANs over here and it's the routers that connect the two together. They're always connected to at least two different networks. Uh, routers transmit data in the form of packets from one network to another. And they work, as I say, by scanning data packets to see if the destination IP address is on a local network or not. If it's not on the local network, then the router sends uh, data onto the connected WAN. Uh, routers are used to connect switches in homes and business lands to the internet. Um, and probably in your home, you've got something like a BT Home Hub or you've got a Virgin Media Super Hub or something. And what that device is, is actually a switch and a router combined together. So all the And a wireless access point, actually. So all the devices that connect to your Super Hub um, by cables or by wireless access points will connect to a switch and then whenever they want to send data to each other that's fine, the switch can do that but if ever they need to send data out to the internet then it will be passed on to the internal integrated router which then passes it on to the internet. To help make a bit more sense of uh, switches and routers and how they work and what they do we're now going to watch a video uh, that I found on YouTube, which is quite good at explaining in a bit more technical detail how they work and what the differences are between them. Hi, I'm Peter. In this video, I'll explain the difference between three popular types of network devices, hubs, switches and routers. Let's start with the hub. Hubs are cheap and simple devices that can connect a bunch of computers to each other, but they're a little wasteful with bandwidth. Here's how they work. When a computer sends information to a hub, it replicates the data on all other interfaces. It works like this. Bit comes in, clones come out. Bit comes in, clones come out. You get the general idea. A hub doesn't know anything about packets and it doesn't bother figuring out who is supposed to receive the data. No, it just spams everyone. The receiver will get the message, and the other hosts will ignore packets if the receiver field doesn't match their own address. Not bad for a glorified bit cloning machine. Alright, so every incoming bit is replicated on all other interfaces. That's a fairly simple and cheap way to create a network, however, it does cause a lot of unnecessary traffic. If you have five hosts in your network, hubs unnecessarily send every packet to three hosts that aren't interested. That's a huge waste of bandwidth. Also, keep in mind that other people in the network can see your traffic if they use free software like Wireshark. If you're embarrassed about your addiction to funny cat videos, maybe hubs aren't your best choice. Now wait a minute, there's a better way to do this. If our hub kept a list of where every host can be reached, then it would be able to send every packet straight to its destination without spamming the entire network. That's what switches do. In this example, we've plugged in computer A to port 1 and computer B to port 6. Each network card has a unique address that switches can use to identify a computer. They're called MAC addresses. They're not only used for Ethernet connections, Wi-Fi uses it too. If computer A has a MAC address of 6 times AA, then the switch will know that the computer with that MAC address can be reached on interface 1. In addition, we know that computer B, which has a MAC address of 6 times BB, can be found on interface 6. All this information will go into the switch table. Now, for this example, I will add two more computers. Computer C is hooked up to port 3 and computer D is hooked up to port 4. We have our network now, let's see how it works in practice. We always start with an empty switch table, because the switch has to learn where everything is. And in this example, we will send a packet from computer A to computer C. At this point, the switch does not know where C is, so it will just behave like a hub and flood everything. But it's learning. 
By checking the MAC address in the packet sender field, it learns that computer A can be found on port 1. It will store this information in its switch table. Now watch what happens when we send a packet from computer C to computer A. Since the switch knows that computer A can be reached on port 1, it doesn't have to flood the entire network. It only has to send the packet to port 1. The switch now knows where computer C is and adds a new entry to its switch table. Hubs and switches are devices that can be used to create networks, but what if we want to send packets between those networks? That's where routers come in. Say you want to send a packet to your search engine from your home laptop. Once you send your packet to the internet, how does it find its way to the search engine server? That's the work of routers. Once you send the packet to your internet provider, routers make sure that your packet is passed on from network to network so that it eventually reaches its destination. If all goes well, that is. You probably have your own router at home too. It forms a bridge between your own private network and the network of your internet provider. Through the network of your internet provider, you can reach the rest of the internet. Okay, I'd like you now to fill out pages 4 and 5 of your worksheet. And once you've done that, your prep is going to be to go onto Google Classroom, where there's an information sheet about Wi-Fi attached to this assignment. I want you to read that. Then I want you to fill in the blanks on pages 6 and 7 of the worksheet using the information that you've learnt from that um, Wi-Fi sheet. Um, and you might also need to use your blue revision guides as well to help you find the right words. Once you've done that, I want you to turn to uh, page 8 and complete the activity, which is to draw a diagram of a typical home network showing all of the devices on that network connected together. So you want to have uh, at least two devices connected by wires, maybe a, a computer and a printer, uh, two or more devices connected by Wi-Fi, maybe a phone and an iPad or uh, a smart TV. I want you to have a network switch showing the wires from the devices going into the network switch. I want you to have a router connected to the switch which also connects onto the internet. And I want you to have a wireless access point which also connects to the switch but has wireless connections then to the wireless devices in your home. Once you've done all of that, uh, you're finished with that worksheet and you have covered everything you need to know about network hardware and Wi-Fi.